I want to kind of delve into dealing with uh, security around the world, kind of a dual perspective, if you will, because so much of it is similar. Um, whether you're looking to, to go after a, a new market or a new opportunity business, due diligence overseas, or you're looking to have your business travelers taken well care of, a lot of, a lot of the information, the, the principles are, are, are somewhat the same. So we're going to kind of take it from, from that bend, if you will. Um, and then we'll talk about some specific precautions and considerations and um, more along the lines of crisis planning and things that, that uh, it, it's, it's interesting and, and, and it's fun to talk about and, and it's, it's good information to have. Um, one of the things we talk about in, in our business is what's the threat? You'll, you'll hear um, security people always ask that question. What's the threat when we go here or we go there? Um, yesterday I was at uh, the uh, OSAC gathering in, in the State Department. It's the Overseas Security Advisory Council. It's, it's a, a, an amazing gathering of security professionals where the, uh, there's a public-private consortium from the State Department that's actually been very successful. And they give a, a, a threat briefing all day. Now, I have to tell you, listening to a threat briefing all day, you know, you don't want to lose your faith in humanity. But, but it's, it's really interesting, and, and just to see the, the talent and experience in the room, was, was it, it, I, I'm always just kind of awed to be there. And what, what we get from that, and, and you compound, com, combine that with the information that ASI provides, you know, I'm, I'm in charge of our intelligence division, it, we put all that together and we identify for those people that want to go overseas, what is the threat, you know? Um, we rate everything through a one through five, one being very low threat. If you look on, on the, the mouse pad, that's, a, that's our threat map. We have a big version that, that uh, if you want one, we'd be glad to send you. Um, the, the colors, is it, you go by, you know, Greenland is, is low threat. Um, it's a one. We don't know why. It just is. No, I'm kidding. It's Greenland. It's not a bad place to go. Um, the red areas are, the, are the, the most severe threat, extreme. We call it a very high threat is how we rate it. And it's in areas where there's a lot of trouble. Um, there's, there's probably some armed conflict, maybe a war going on in those regions, and, and they're, they're dangerous places to go visit. Um, you, you, we look at um, the list on here. We've got crime, and we've got ethnic or, or political issues. We've got significant political instability, kidnapping, and terrorism. We actually look at 15 different specific categories to identify and come up with this number that we assign. And then what we'll do is we'll explain what that is, because the, the threat whether it's you know a, a level three threat, as you can see, Mexico is rated the same as the United States. Well, why is that, Tom? Well, if you go to Cancun, it's not that dangerous. But if you go to Mexico City, as we all know, kidnap is on the rise, and that's a problem. If you go to the border region, it's really bad. So it, 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 you can't rate a country by one place or another, but we kind of take it in totality. We'll probably rate a city many times in a higher threat destination higher than the country itself. Um, one of the things we always say, and this applies to the world of due diligence, it applies to the world of travel, is know before you go. There's a lot of value in knowing before you go. Um, a well-armed traveler or a well-armed business is going to save money down the road before they get to that location. You walk into an emergency that you didn't expect, and as you know, they always cost more money. Um, one of the things that, that we, you want to identify, you want to look at whatever inf information sources you have access to. Um, I've listed government foreign service websites. Um, the other countries have websites. You might, you might find some travel websites. We provide a website at ASI that has a, we're, we're the third party provider. Um, and then, then you want to go to local contacts. Um, things that you need to be very careful to understand is, is cultural differences. Um, understanding, uh, what is your mission? And what I'm talking about is let's say you're, you, um, you want to go enter into your mission. Maybe you're an NGO. And your job was to, uh, let's kind of go back 100 years, your job is to empower sheep farmers in Wyoming in 1888. You're not going to be very popular in Wyoming if your job is to empower sheep farmers in 1888. You want to know that before you go there and open up a business that says, we're going to put cattle ranchers out of business. That's just not a good thing to do. Maybe you need to adjust your mission before you go. Maybe you need to look at another business to get into, or maybe you just need to stay home for a while and look in a different direction. <laughs> we talk about local contacts. One of the very important things to know about local contacts, and this is a true story. I said, um, I was talking, we use, uh, we have an on the ground network of operators um, all over the world, and some really great people. And it's amazing. I, I have these 
amazing friendships I've built up with people who I've never, some of them I've never met in person. And I know about their kids, they know about my kids, and we've dealt with a lot of things in the middle of the night together. Um, I was talking to one of them one day there was about a very specific neighborhood in, in a town that was a little, little rougher than Houston. And he said, uh, well, you know, it's not that bad. We only had two bombings this week. No one lives in a bad neighborhood, okay? <laughs> if, if, if I said we only had two bombings in Houston this week to my wife before we moved to Houston, I think she would punch me or say, we're not moving to Houston, honey. <laughs> it's all perspective. So when you talk to the locals, remember, they're, they're talking about their home. And so you want to use all the information that's available to you to, to get a perspective of what they're really talking about. And the threat to you may not be the threat to me, and vice versa. Um, if you're going into Wyoming in 1888 and you're a cowboy, you're in good shape. If you're going into Wyoming in 1888 and you're a sheep farmer, you're not. And that's pretty simple to understand. Um, oftentimes, we live, in, we live in the United States, we live in the West. Um, you know, it's not the same for women travelers as it is for men travelers in the rest of the world, and that's just a fact. Um, things to know that you need to know. Um, it was, it's been said that, uh, that if, when we step off the plane, no matter where we are, they know we're Americans. And you can dress locally, you can speak the language, you can walk as best as you can and try to blend in, but I've heard a million people tell me you can't hide that you're an American. If people in that town don't like Americans, you need to know that and prepare yourself accordingly. Kind of some must-dos, if you will, for businesses that are looking to go overseas. We talked about the threat. What you need to have is a specific threat assessment to where you're going and what you're going to do so you can build the precautions into your business, that you, in your business plan, that you need to build in. You want to avoid like I said, going back, you want to avoid emergency spending. You want to avoid margin erosion. How do you do that? By understanding what precautions you need to build in to your plan when you go there. Um, the threat assessment needs to be specific to the organization and the people that are going to work there. Are you going to have a large amount of expats? Are you going to have a large amount of local nationals? Does it make a difference? Um, you talk about your on-the-ground resources. We talk about hotels when you first go. And then if you're going to have a large amount of expats, where are they going to live? Do you need to have compound housing? Do you need to have houses with higher security? Or does it even really matter where you're going to be? Do you need to have armored cars? Do you not? Do they need to have a driver? I, I don't know how many of you ever have ever driven in Mexico City. I've been to Mexico City. I will never drive in Mexico City. I don't know how they do that. It's, it's amazing to me. It's amazing how people drive in Washington, D.C. to me. But, but we go to Mexico, I always have to get a driver, or Tom won't be around very long. Things that you need to know about your expats. If they're going to be there for a year, you're probably going to want to get them a driver in a location like Mexico City. But maybe after a year, you get them used to it, they understand it a little better, maybe not. Or are you in a location where if you get in an accident and you're from out of town, it's automatically your fault. And the people whose fault it is go to jail. Is that important to know? It's probably very important to know for your business travelers and for your expats that are overseas. Uh, 